For such an old-ass franchise as the Chicago Cubs are, the choice of Ron Santo as the boss card in the latest show program, Field of Dreams, is quite honestly a perfect selection for them. Looking at his career stats on Baseball Rec, you will see a lot of CHC next to a lot of bold numbers, next to a lot of clickable links for the awards Santo won with the Cubs. Santo was able to produce and play hard despite being on some truly awful Cubs teams. From the start of his career in 1960 to when he left in 1973, the Cubs would finish in 7th, 7th, 9th, 7th, 8th, 8th, last, third, third in the National League, and then when divisions were made, they finished second, second, third, second, and fifth in the National League East. Even on some of the worst teams in the league, Santo would excel, earning all-star selections nine times in 10 years from 1963 to 1973, five straight gold gloves at third base from 1964 to 68, and offensively, Santo would never register a season with an OBP under 300 until his final year. A reliable, consistent player, Santo was the left side anchor for Chicago starting in the early 1960s and lasting until the early 1970s. Santo was so reliable that in 1965, he led the entire league in games played, playing in 164 games, a season in which the Cubs came in eighth place. In his entire career, Ron Santo would put up a lifetime average of 277 batting, 342 home runs, 2,254 hits, 1,331 RBIs, and 70.5 WAR. Wars? War units? Wounits? What is the plural of this stat? Numbers are just one side to what makes Ron Santo such a good selection for the Cubs. His entire life story is pretty much a cheesy, made-for-TV Disney movie character art seemingly brought to reality. February 25th, 1940, Ronald Edward Santo is born in Seattle, Washington, the second child to Louis and Vivian Santo. Growing up near the old site of Six Stadium in Seattle, home of the Cincinnati Reds' top farm team, the Seattle Rainiers, young Ron would work here as an usher, in the press box, and in the clubhouse. Santo became a star in three sports at nearby Franklin High School, and even when he was a freshman filling in at other positions, Major League Scouts were hovering nearby watching the 14-year-old play. As a sophomore, Santo became close friends with Dave Kosher, scout for the Chicago Cubs. According to Saber, quote, Santo respected Kosher both as a person and as a sound baseball man. Kosher passed word about Santo up to the Cubs' lead scout, Roy Hard Rock Johnson. Hard Rock offered Santo a signing bonus of $20,000 and an amount which was less than being offered to other players. Hard Rock also told Santo he wanted to sign him as a catcher because, quote, I don't think you can play third base in the big leagues. I bet you are probably wondering who this Hard Rock guy is. Well, in his only big league season, the 1918 World War I shortened campaign, he compiled a 1-5 in five record with a 3.42 ERA in 10 games and 50 innings pitched for the Philadelphia Athletics. His managing career is just as impressive. In early May 1944, during the Second World War, the Cubs lost 9 of their first 10 games. Serving as interim manager for one game between the changing of the guard, Hard Rock led Chicago to a 10-4 loss to the Cincinnati Reds, their 10th in a row. Hard Rock was so on the fringes of the major leagues, it took literal world wars for him to be called up to the bigs. Anyway, back to Santo. Although Cincinnati and other teams had offered him more money, Ron Santo chose the Chicago deal. 
Santos signed with the Cubs as he thought this was the quickest path to the majors. He was not wrong. In 1959, at age 19, Ron Santo was signed as a free agent by Chicago and sent to Mesa, Arizona for the Cubs' rookie camp. At this camp, Santo's foray into the annals of baseball history was not a toe in the water, but rather a headfirst dive right into the butthole of legends. First, he met the Cubs' rookie hitting instructor, Rogers Hornsby, a titan of the game's last generation. Also in this camp was a new rookie outfielder coming up through the minor league system, Billy Williams. Santo and Williams would begin to form a bond in this camp and develop a lifelong friendship. After the three weeks of camp, Hornsby assembled the prospects together and went down the line critiquing each player, ripping into each prospect in front of him. As Hornsby got to Santo, his tone switched up and he said, quote, you can hit in the big leagues right now. Moving to Williams, Hornsby again made similar remarks, saying he too would make the bigs. Despite this group being all the top prospects in the Cubs system, only Santo and Williams would make it eventually to the major leagues. From his start in AA to his first appearance for the Chicago Cubs, Santo's rise through the farm system would take just about 15 months. Moved from catcher to third base, when the 1960 season came around, Cubs management felt like one season in double A was not enough experience to bring Santo up to the majors yet. They elected to send the 19-year-old to triple A to start the season. Then during the 1960 season, Chicago dropped 16 and a half games back residing in last place and decided there was nothing to lose in keeping Santo in the minors anymore. Called up and assigned the duties at third base, Santo would occupy this position for the next 13 years. In those years is when he collected all the wars. Again, what is that unit? One major thing Santo had kept away from the public in the majority of his career was the fact that since the start of his minor league time, he had been diagnosed with a form of diabetes. At this time, the average life expectancy for a diabetic patient was just about 25 years. Fearing it would affect his odds in the major leagues, Ron elected to keep his diagnosis a secret. In August 1971, over a decade into his career, Santo went public with the news that he had been diabetic and had dealt with these struggles his entire tenure in baseball. Most teammates and Chicago media members knew but had respected his wishes to not make it public. Then 1973 came around. After the end of the season that year, the Cubs were rebuilding their entire core and traded away aging franchise icons for whom they could get. The first casualty came on October 25th, when the Cubs traded Fergie Jenkins to the Texas Rangers for Vic Harris and Bill Mad Dog Matlock. November 3rd came around, and the Chicago Cubs traded Bob Locker to the Oakland Athletics for Horatio Pena. I feel bad for Bob. I feel bad for Bob because June 8th, 1969, Bob was traded by the Chicago White Sox to the Seattle Pilots for Gary Bell. Then a year later, June 15, 1970, after moving to Milwaukee, Bob's contract was purchased by the Oakland Athletics from the new Brewers. November 21, 1972, Bob is traded by the Oakland Athletics to the Chicago Cubs for Bill North. Then, about a year later, the 1973 trade happens. Bob is traded by the Chicago Cubs back to the Oakland Athletics. He isn't done, as on October 23rd, 1974, Bob was then traded by the Oakland Athletics with Daryl Knowles and Manny Trio back to the Chicago Cubs for rookie camp survivor Billy Williams. Finally, it's over for Bob when on June 25th, 1975, he was released by the Chicago Cubs. What a reverse back! Stip, stop, stip, stop, stip, stop! I did! You've no idea the physical toll that three trades with Oakland is have a person. Okay, back to those 1973 trades we were talking about. 
November 7th comes around, the Cubs trade multi-time All-Star Glenn Beckett and Bobby Fenwick to the San Diego Padres for Jerry Morales. Then, December 11th, 1973 comes about, and Ron Santo is traded across town to the Chicago White Sox for Ken Frailings, Steve Stone, Steve Swisher, and everybody's favorite trade piece, a player to be named later. Ken was a solid relief pitcher, but it was the pair of Steves that is worth following up on. After bouncing around a few more years, Steve Stone would eventually find his rhythm in 1980 and earn 25 wins as a pitcher with Baltimore, with a 3.23 ERA and 9 complete games, a performance good enough to win him the American League Cy Young Award. Steve Swisher was a middling baseball player, but his son on the other hand, Nick, would see more success in pro baseball, as well as having been recently brought back to the show. Remember, this video is supposed to be about that game there. Just to wrap up the Cubs transactions in 1973 and early 1974, before the start of the next year's season, the Pittsburgh Pirates would buy the contract of a quadruple A-level middle inferior that would never again appear as a baseball player in the major leagues, but still to this day has a very strong effect on the game. This infielder at the end of their career, you ask? His name? Tony La Russa. After just one season mainly filling in as the DH for the White Sox, one year later Ron Santo would retire on December 13th, 1974 at the age of 34. Some of the highlights of his career include a 10 RBI day, his greatest game where he scored four runs in a 4-3 extra inning walk-off victory, a 28-game hitting streak, and Ron Santo Day, at which he revealed his diabetic status and brought a lot of attention to that issue. In the post-baseball life, Santo's relationship with the Cubs continued to be reciprocally positive. In 1990, he began to appear as the WGN radio color commentary for Cubs games. Thousands, millions, billions, trillions of young Belizean children tuned in for Cubs games on their jerry-rigged TV sets. They could hear Ron Santos' boundless adoration for the Chicago Cubs blaring out their speakers. Belize is a country where at times Chicago Cub stars are more popular than the Queen. In their defense, how many wars does she have? True, very good point. Santo's broadcasting career was known for his unabashed expression of how he felt about the game. Ripped straight from the Wikipedia page, quote, as excitable as Santo was when a great play for the Cubs occurred, he was equally as vocal in his displeasure when events turned against the Cubs. One of Santos' most famous moments in his broadcasting career was not a call or a play on the field, but instead a moment in which his burning passion for the game of baseball materialized. While standing for the national anthem in the cramped broadcast booth at Shea Stadium, Santos co-announcer Pat Hughes said he started to hear something sizzling like bacon. Hughes turns around to see that Ron Santos' cheap toupee had caught fire and his whole head was engulfed in flames. Reacting quickly, Hughes grabbed a nearby cup of water and poured it on the blazing toupee. Knowing his priorities at that moment, Santo quickly asked his rescuer, how do I look? In 1999, Santo was named to the Cubs' all-century team. A few years later, on September 28, 2003, the Cubs retired Santo's jersey along with his number 10. At the time, this was only the third player to have their number retired by the Cubs, Santo joining fellow teammates Ernie Banks and his good friend from rookie camp, Billy Williams. While his spirits never wavered, Santo's health was a constant struggle. He used his status as a renowned ball player to bring attention and support to causes involving diabetes. Charities inspired by Santo have gone on to raise tens of millions of dollars for diabetic research. 
By the time of his name being retired in the early 2000s, Santo had both his legs amputated below the knees due to the worsening state of his condition. December 3rd, 2010, early in the morning in a hospital in Scottsdale, Arizona, Ron Santo passed away due to complications from bladder cancer and diabetes. At his service, he was carried by his former teammates, Ernie Banks, Fergie Jenkins, Randy Hunley, Glenn Beckett, and Billy Williams. And his casket was draped with the number 10 flag that flew over Wrigley the day his number was retired. For the entire 2011 season, the Cubs wore a patch on their sleeve with the number 10 on it in tribute. In August 2011, a statue of a young Ron Santo playing third base was unveiled outside of Wrigley Field. However, one missing accolade for this franchise legend was admission into Cooperstown. After falling off or barely missing the cut on numerous Hall of Fame ballots, as the new millennium came, opinions started to change. Even on the Veterans Committee ballots, and finishing third in 2003, tied for first in 2005, and first in 2007 and 2009 induction ballots, he still fell short of the required number of votes each year. 2010 came about and the creation of the new 16-member Golden Era Committee, which was tasked with identifying 10 candidates that were selected by the Historical Overview Committee from the 1947 to 1972 era to vote on and then find obscure petty reasons not to elect them to be in the Hall of Fame. December 5th, the 16-member Golden Era Committee begins to vote on the 10 candidates selected by the screening committee. Billy Williams made a strong case for Ron Santo, pointing to his personal struggles with diabetes during his playing career, numerous accolades, and his post-baseball work to charitable causes looking to help diabetic peoples. Of the 16 voters, Santo received 15 votes and was the only one of the 10 candidates to be elected to the Hall of Fame. Santo was disappointed that he could not see that moment in his lifetime, but in the end, his story will be forever preserved. So the next time you launch that no doubter, smash that perfect, perfect liner to the gap, or turn that clutch double down the left field line with signature series Ron Santo, reflect how we got to that place, point up to the sky, and declare deep from within, fuck you, diabetes. <laughs>